Good evening everybody and welcome to the Marketing Society's Sundowner Session, the Under the Spotlight Session with our friends at Media Monks this evening. My name's Sophie, I'm the CEO of the Marketing Society, the global community of marketing change leaders. So tonight is an example of what we do at the Marketing Society which is to steal with pride the insights, the stories, the experiences of leaders who've been successful. To or, not, help, or not. Or not. Their failures, whatever they want to talk about. The experiences of people who've been there, done that, made an impact. So that the rest of us can be uplifted, can learn, can go faster, learn more and do more together. Please I, don't. I spoke to Sir Martin in Singapore a few months ago. And in doing that, spent a bit of time researching his story. And there's just a couple of things you should be aware of. What you don't know is their history and what's gone on behind it all. Sir Martin's grandparents came to the UK as refugees from the Ukraine. When they arrived in England, they could not speak English. They signed their, I think their marriage certificate with an ex, yeah? Uh, which feels ironic to me. Somebody whose grandson has gone on to be such a, a titan of communications. And Sir Martin, aged 40, decided to found WPP. And then by the time he left, took it from nothing to a $16 billion market cap, 200,000 people, 113 companies. He is now executive chairman of S4 Capital, which in 2018 merged with Media Monks. Media Monk's team are here tonight, lots to talk to them about. What you need to know is that they are multi-award winning, all the stuff that you'd expect, including the one I liked, Newsweek's, uh, part of Newsweek's top 100 most loved places to work. But what I want to do tonight is try something really difficult, which is in a really tiny period of time, we are going to get as much as possible out of the conversation with Sir Martin to help each of you. So this is not a typical under the spotlight for us. This is a speed version. We've got I, I don't do speed. I know, this is the challenge. We've got speed sorrel. We've got super fast leadership insights. And we're going to be talking about him as a leader, as a pace setter. I'm going no. to get personal. We are going to talk, of course, about the revolution about the world, what's happening right now. And we're going to talk, because it's a subject close to my heart, about what marketing leaders should be doing right now to survive and thrive. We're gonna do all that in a tiny period of time. Headlines, You've gone on nuggets. so long, we've run out of time. <laughs> so, Sir Martin, all right, uh, you didn't like it. You didn't like it. You didn't like the introduction. Let's do you, let's do you. If we were to talk- I was it asking you for trouble. If we were to talk to somebody who had worked closely with you Ooh. and get them to describe you in Ooh. three words, three different words, what would they be? Um, impossible, impossible, impossible. Same words, <laughs> see, can't even follow the brief. Yeah. <laughs> no, just one word, impossible. Impossible, why? Um, difficult. Ah, this goes back to something you said in the past about great people are difficult or difficult people are great. Not particularly, but I think um, probably demanding. Um, Keep your mic close to your mouth because we've got to... Probably be... too demanding, if the truth be known. So um, set sort of tough objectives or set tough um, targets. Um, very ambitious. Um, don't take no for an answer. Persistent. Um, so those are some of the... Those are some of the possible words. So demanding, ambitious. I know you're ambitious for what next. Yeah. Uh, so if you if you were a brand, Sir Martin, yes. you know, this is kind of a repositioning or yeah. it's a, a new thing happening. <laughs> what either either tell me what kind of what brand would you be or what kind of brand do you well, want would, to be? It known would have for? to be, you know, given what happened this morning, it has to be NVIDIA, doesn't it? It's certainly not Boeing. <laughs> I mean, I, actually, on a serious note, I found that quite, um, when I woke up this morning, I turned on where I'm staying, I can only get BBC, I can't get Bloomberg or CNBC, and I could get it on my iPad, I suppose, but 
Um, and I was watching, watching BBC and it was quite actually an important moment, I think, because you had Boeing, which we always thought was a, um, an extremely safe brand. And I actually looked at the TV and thought, should I travel on a Boeing plane? It did flash across my mind as I, I knew Dave Calhoun from Nielsen days, because he ran Nielsen for many years. And I was watching him being grilled by Congress and then it flashed at Jensen flashing, I think it must have been Blackwell at the TV screen and the market cap crossing three trillion. And I think actually it's a seminal moment because what you have is a, a new age engineer and the old age engineers. So one, one brand really in trouble and brand, one brand on a, on a high. And so it's really interesting to, to see what will happen from here. So this is such a moment in time for so many people right now, yep. right? This moment of change. So a lot of people here are divided between, oh, everything is happening, it's just, you know, more tools, or a moment of revolution, you know, the fourth industrial yep. re revolution. You're on the side of this is exciting, interesting, terrific, or terrible right now? Um, I'm on the side of it's a revolution. Um, I don't think it's just a tool. Um, there are going to be, there are going to be people, there are going to be CMOs, for example. And I was very um, intrigued by an article in the in campaign a few weeks ago, where they recounted they, an unnamed CMO. They wouldn't name who it was, him or her. Uh, but him or her had said they fed into ChatGPT or Gemini the brief, and they got three good ideas. And they're going to run with one of them. So you're going to have people who do that. And on the other hand, you're going to have people who say that you know, humans will always win out and they'll be at the top of the pyramid. Uh, I, I, read, you know, I read a report, I didn't listen to it or watch it, that David Drogo with the Chief Innovation Officer of OpenAI. And I, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I found it a bit, the report, the report maybe the, the, the actual interview was, was strong, but I thought it was really banal. And it really came into this, at the end of the day, it was one sentence about who's going to win out. And both agreed that humans will win out. I'm not so sure. I think I would, um, and I think Elon Musk today has suggested that humans might not win out. And I think that, that we're going to have two camps. And it's going to be really interesting to see and it will play out i think in fairly quick time i don't think it's going to be a long time before we start to see these things change so in our own case um we've seen it already in visualization and copywriting we're seeing it already in personalization at scale it's going to come in media planning and buying big time yeah. so those three areas i think uh, we're already starting to see some revolution and the, est pace. the established players are going to have a lot of difficulty. Our advantage is we're not established. Yeah. So it's a bit like the combustion engine manufacturer as opposed to the EV manufacturer. And we're the EV manufacturer and somebody else is making combustion engines. So reasons to be optimistic for you and seeing what's happening. So it's not just a revolution, it's a battle. Human versus machine. Yeah, I mean it's pretty scary when you see um, you see the stuff about dro drone wars in the future. You see this these articles about robot dogs, which uh, I think the Chinese uh, one Chinese observer has said that robot dogs are, are more accurate marksmen or marks women, how you define them, than humans. So things are moving at pace, and in some level, are scary. I think Musk yesterday not in the open session, but in the closed sessions, was very concerned about the power of machines yeah. and what they may or may not do. So what do what does the human do then? So if you had, um, if we go time travel back in time, you've made different choices in your life and you've ended up with a marketing career. So you're a CMO right now. What three things would you be doing? Well, I, I, think, I think we've, we've laid this out and i'll lay it out again because it's i think just as relevant now i mean people talk talk about agility we talk about agility in the context of media monks 
or S4. I'm having to compete with the birthday party as well. Um, we're going to have to change the venue next year, I think. Yes. Um, so I think agility is, is key. And everybody talks about it, the ability to deliver it. I mean, we may have some clients in the room and I, 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 um, I risk upsetting some or all. Um, CEOs of clients talk about agility when you actually deal with their organizations. They lack them. Um, we sometimes suffer than that, that ourselves. So agility is one thing. Uh, the second thing is taking back control. I think... Um, oh, what a phrase. I think uh, clients surrendered too much. This may sound strange coming from me or an agency. Um, I think clients surrendered too much control after 2008. Zero-based budgeting became very popular and people basically outsourced too much the agencies. I mean, we were talking to one client here who was saying the headcount control is so strict that all they can do in the one of the areas in which we service them is engage outside parties. I remember when we used to deal with Ford Motor Company, when a restriction, headcount restriction was put in, one way of squeezing the balloon was to hire people from the outside of agencies. So that's what happened. As a result of what's happening with third party cookies, deprecation, what's happening with first party data, building those databases, it's critically important to have more control. So we've got agility ability, working on that, take back control. control. And then the th third thing is first party data. But we would have had a Y2K moment if deprecation had happened on 31st of December this year. It's been delayed, but many, most clients that, that I come across have not got databases, first party databases that are suitable, fit for purpose, or have ignored it, or have, you know, grown by acquisition, and have systems that really don't pull together. So those three things, I would, now that's not new news, but those are the three areas I think are the most important. Yeah, and that, that data is the new oil and, and really getting into it. Um, interestingly, I was looking back on a Marketing Society report from 10 years ago, uh, we did something with, um, it was a report called Tough at the Top, where we spoke to a number of chief executives and senior business leaders about what was going on then. And it was actually kicked off by an off-the-cuff remark from Sir Martin Sorrell, who said um, he was asked what makes a great marketer. And his response was, just out of interest, I don't know if you remember this, a CEO with a strong marketing-led vision that enables the CMO to get the job done. So, CMOs right now, how do they build better relationships with the CEOs? What are you seeing that's working between those two? I think it's more complicated now. So if that was 10 years ago, I think CMOs have to deal with uh, CIOs, chief sales officers. I mean, I think I'm thinking one client that we work with at the moment on uh, personalization at scale where we're dealing with CMO, CSO, Chief Sales Officer, and CIO. So it's much more complicated. They've got uh, all, all those relationships all those to manage. And then in addition, they probably have to deal with the CFO and the Chief Procurement Officer. So it is much more multifaceted. I think the other problem, and which I would add to it, is that everybody's looking short term. Uh, and it may be, and they, this may be bad news for some, it may be that um, life has become much more short term. You know, my dad said, going back to my, yeah. my, my roots, um, you know, find an industry that you like, a company inside it that you like, build a reputation, you fancy doing something on your own. When you're 40, mid, midway between starting at 20 and retiring at 60, now that's all out, of the, win there? All out of the window. Um, but the point is, I think people, things have become much more short term. You know, thinking about Boeing for a minute, which has been, been around for a long period of time, but the rise of NVIDIA, the rise of Apple, the rise of Microsoft, the rise fall or check of Microsoft and the rise of Microsoft, all been pretty short term stuff. Digital is now, will this year be 700 billion of ad revenues? In 2020, maybe 1997, it was virtually nothing. Yeah. So we've seen a huge shift um, 
done in very short periods of time. That's very different. So I think brand building has become very short term. I know that's anathema to say mm -hmm. it can, but um, I think we're going to see very quickly personalization at scale become extremely important, partly because clients are very focused on the short term. You know, so, I remember one CMO saying to me last year, financial services company, new CEO, the CEO came in and to him the first week he was there and said, What's, why are we spending all this money on this upper funnel stuff, all these sponsorships and everything? I have to go before analysts or institutional investors every three months and say what our like-for-like -like revenues are or what, what were the increase or decreases. So I think people, private equity is four, four or five years max in terms of their hold periods. So the life of a CEO is on average about five years, of a CMO maybe a couple of years. So the, people are moving very, very short term. And I, and I, I also think that um, <coughs> most of the companies we deal with, not all, there's a separation between ownership and control. So there are institutions that own and there are managers who run. The mentality of managers is very different to owners. Yeah, so and the separation of that. Yes, and I think that separation causes short-term thinking. We see it in our own industry. Um, without going into the gory detail, you can see that. And I think that's a problem. So the battle isn't just going on between humans and machines, it's the short and the long term. And, and you do have to deliver fast, although you know maybe there's a, uh, an opportunity to stand out for those people who are looking long term and who can do it. But where you haven't talked at all, Sir Martin, about creativity and where, what role that plays, where it can, it's a festival of it all. Well, where I does that fit for you? Well, I, yeah, with all due respect to can, it, and it's a festival, we did another session this morning, and it was introduced as, as the festival of creativity. It isn't. It's a festival of creativity and tech. Okay. It resembles to me. I mean, I said to, we had a meeting with one of our clients just now, and it it's more and more like CES, and CES is more and more like CAN. And I don't know whether it's because Michael Casson was involved with both of them at one point in time, and may be involved with them both again in the future. But um, maybe it was his influence. But if you went to CES 10 or 15 years ago, it was a pure tech fest. Today, it's much more a tech and creative. I mean, the agency is there in full flow. Similarly here, this was a bunch of French creatives. Seven, I think it started 71 years ago, actually. Yeah. Um, a bunch of French creatives who were sitting on the closet smoking gulwas and talking about creativity today it's very very different um, by the way I think it's it is more inclusive it is more diverse today than it's been apart from being more tech I still don't think that can is international enough and I say that because I spent a week in Brazil last week uh, in Rio and uh, Tough Life and uh, Rio to Can. And what struck me, I mean, I, I sort of had come across it before, but there is really a resentment um, in the global south, which includes Russia, which I think you should put to one side, it's not part of the global south, but there's a real resentment uh, towards the US and the West, Western Europe, I guess. Uh, towards the hegemony that they've been subjected to over the years. And I think CAN has to reflect that even more. I mean, we, are, we have seen it, to be fair, yeah. the rise of Latin America, South yeah. America, Middle East coming up, obviously Asia, yeah. Africa, but it, the, the balance is still wrong. And um, I think we're gonna get a rude awakening if we haven't already had a rude awakening of the depth of talent, both creatively and technologically, in other parts of the world apart from the US. If and we're Western too UK Europe. and US biased. Yeah, I mean, there was a guy, it was quite funny actually, on BBC the day before today, 
uh, who was representing the UK Export Council for, um, I think it was UK Export Council, and it was funny because his his interview was coming from Cannes, it got cut off, it went down twice on BBC, live on BBC, but he said that exports from, from Britain and advertising were 18 billion, um, and was saying, lauding this as being wonderful, and cl describing clients falling over themselves for British creativity. To some extent that's so, but it, it, I thought it was too chauvinistic and the quality of the talent that we see in other parts of the world is, it's underrepresented here, I think, and it's, um, it, it really is greater than people think. I mean, I have to say, I mean, it feels, the conversations I'm having, it feels like it's changing. And when we're a, a global community and we've been, we had a session on Asia yesterday and where to learn, there are ideas from everywhere and it's a great opportunity to do it. But you're absolutely right, there is more to be done. There are ideas everywhere that we can bring everybody together. And that sort of, uh, perhaps as a cultural well, I mean, just one, one economic fact, I think, the, G7, the E7, which is the um, so-called emerging, I don't like that, that word, but emerging seven nations are bigger in GDP than the G7. And if you strip out China and the US, the E6 is still bigger than the G6. So the world, you know, the, I shouldn't put it this way, the worm has turned and yeah, the world is a different place. So, and I don't think we acknowledge that uh, here. Or, or elsewhere for that matter. Well, I mean, a global perspective, the, the best leaders should have that peripheral vision, be looking up and around and seeing what's happening. Okay, I'm going to start to, to, to run to the quick fire questions now. Right. Just a, a couple of quick things. You, marketing, what's happening. Um, so, I'm, when you talk about that with this with such passion, one of the things I would love to steal from you, Sir Martin, is your energy that you still have for what you're doing and, and these battles and these fights. My, my mother's genes. Is that what it is? It's just genetic. There's nothing you do to yes. preserve your well, energy. Well, you know, somebody said, you know, Henry Kissinger died when he was 100. And if you remember, he never was fussy about exercise. I don't think he ever exercised any part of his body. Maybe he did. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> he didn't. He didn't restrain his diet in any way. Um, and yet he lived to be 100. And as Niall Ferguson, who was his, his current biographer, said that was due to genetics. So that's probably the strongest thing. But you know, we get, we're gonna have a digital twin, which will be able to diagnose all the diseases yeah. I have and do something about them and project and my current lifestyle, where I'm gonna be in five or 10 years time, however long it is, and then take preventative action. So we're all going to live to 120. Yeah. There are and, lots and, of things to be optimistic about. And a NASA about. science scientist said to me in Dublin at the Dublin Tech Conference, you know, we're all going to be working less. He said Henry Ford created the five-day week in 1920s, and is we haven't changed it. Yeah. And he also Time said we're going, to, we're, we're going to we're digital twins. We're going to live to 120. So what the hell are we going to do? Have some fun. But but look, you've got such. The part of the energy comes from you still finding this so interesting. So one tip for everybody here in terms of uh, someone to follow, something to read, something, something to do to make sure that they are keeping their uh, love of learning and the stats topped up. I, I think, I think um, Warren Buffett does the best job. I mean, he, he has the benefit of sitting in Omaha, Nebraska, which some of them, we have a monk's office in Omaha, Nebraska. They've never let me see it, actually. They've hidden it from me. But I think there are, I, I, Joe or, or Kate will be able to tell us how many monks there are in Omaha. But anyway, the secret is um, the, the, just a, a, a thirst for reading stuff, of taking information from any and all sources. I mean, I, one of the biggest frustrations I have is when we meet a client, nobody reads their annual report i find that and you know, it's a very it's a simple easy thing. thing to do yeah. it's a very simple thing to do i remember we did a, a pitch recently and you know you're quoting two or three lines out of the annual report it does it does absolute wonders that you actually took the time to do it so research you know this is the pure david ogilvy right um which is research take time to, and and the the facilities we have available for research now, particularly with AI, 
are just huge. I mean, they they dwarf what we what we had to do a few years ago. So I think just absorbing information from all sources, uh, visual, written, and Buffett is a really interesting example of that. I mean, he um, he makes you know, time for it as well. He has the five five well, hours a week to learn. Well, he doesn't. Very interesting. He has about I counted that. I went to uh, Omaha for as I do every year for the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And uh, many Americans make a pilgrimage to Omaha every year with that. I counted up the brands he had because it was in the stadium. You could, I think there are 53 different companies. So he sits, it's a private equity house really, on top of a business with 53 brands. He has no operational responsibilities whatsoever. He has no central staff. And he spends his time absorbing information and from all sources. And I think that's it's, it's it a very off. simple. Yeah. So but learn, but it, is, it is putting the time in to do the research. I mean, it's linked to what Ogilvy said as well, which is research. I mean, he was, people forget that David sold, he didn't start Ogilvy until he was 40 years old, interestingly. He was an Arga cooker salesman. And then he got his training also at Gallup at the polling company. So he really understood the importance of really deep market research insights, and which we now get still in space. Now, yeah? Yeah. And you just reminded me though, this bit of learning fast, reading, picking it all up and learning from everywhere. I just remember the first time I met Sir Martin and I was sort of trying to talk about, we're, we're doing this session, do you want to know what the questions are, what's going on? I was trying to sort of brief him, check he's okay, talk about that. All he did was grill me solidly for about That's half an hour. That's because I wanted to stop you asking me any questions. About what the marketing society was like, what our marketing leaders were saying, you know, that ability to keep stay curious and keep picking things up from everybody you meet. It's a very good tip, I think, as well. Well, we don't, we don't listen. Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, actually, okay, so let me unload a bit. I, I, you know, I sit in some meetings and we expose we expound we don't ask questions um and i think that's a huge problem we like to hear ourselves speak not listen to what so my favorite question to the clients are, you know what's what's the top of your mind you know what's the thing that you worry about when you go to bed at night or wake up in the morning not personal business i think that's if you ask that question, the other thing is we never we never use free information. Um, if you ask, what kind of free information? Well, you ask a client which work they like best, um, who they, which agencies, for example, they think are good, and then the third one is who in the agencies are good, and you get free. It's for free. And I remember I asked one one client that was when I was at WPP, and she sent me a, a basically a book of all the agencies, all the work that she liked, all the book, all the agencies she liked, and all the people. And instead of having to go to talent agencies and paying them huge fees for it for free, yeah, but you just got to ask. You just got to ask. Yeah. So, so we've got lots of stuff from this. We've got take back control, we've got sort out the data, we've got a complicated question about creativity in tech, we've got the basic, let's just keep asking questions. What for you then is the one thing that everybody here should be feeling optimistic about? Oh no, no, tell me. One, we're not, not what's it, the you're... thing you should be optimistic yeah. about is that Saudi Arabia is willing to do a deal with Israel. That you should be optimistic about, in all seriousness. It may, it may take may, may take Benjamin Netanyahu to go, but that's the one thing because I think the world is a very sticky place. I mean, I again, Vladimir Putin in Pyongyang signing agreements with uh, the supreme leader is not is not very is not very entertaining. But you should that, for that I'm talking from a political point of view. Um, from a business point of view, from an industry point of view, um, this year, this industry will be a trillion dollar industry. Never, get, never gets written about. I mean, we have a lot of journalists here. A trillion Nobody's dollars, a lot of money. Trillion dollar industry. 
and 700 billion of that is going to be in digital. And our major clients account, or many of our major clients account for, of that 700 billion, 450 billion, I can think of, you know, if you look at Alphabet, Meta, and Amazon alone, between them this year, they'll be at about 450. So this is, um, you know, we have a huge opportunity and they're growing. Uh, all those platforms are growing this year, probably at least at 10%. Um, the struggling platforms, you know, Bob Iger is having a tough time at Disney. Uh, Shari Redstone can't make up her mind what she wants to do with Paramount. And David Zaslav has got a, a really hard task at Warner Discovery. And we don't do much of that stuff. Uh, we're in where the growth is. So that that's what we should be focused on. I mean, tech companies are not investing in marketing as aggressively as they did in COVID years or post-COVID years. Um, and last year was a tough year from that point of view. But they'll come back. I think AI means the com competition around the AI is going to make ensure that they do spend or respend, I think, at significant levels. Um, but as an industry, very strong, very strong. See, we've had predictions. We've had some pretty personal stuff, some candid, some political stuff to be discussed over drinks, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Sir Martin, for Speed Sorrow.